What's good, guys? Welcome back to my channel, where I help you to love the scriptures and to reform to the word of God. And as you guys can see, I got my boys with me, and we're going to be answering a lot of common objections to Calvinism. And this is the last video on the series that I've been doing titled, What is Calvinism? Uh, we went through the acrostic tulip, um, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And these three guys are the ones who have been laboring beside me and teaching on these five points on the doctrines of grace. And I thank you guys, first of all, for being on here um, for these past five weeks. It's been a blessing. Um, I know that all three of us, I mean, except, except for Hector, he's going to be our elder, but all three of us want to go into pastoral ministry. And it was kind of weird. It was kind of cool for me to go to this first series because I know that throughout my life and throughout my ministry, this is a series that I'm going to constantly do because I love the doctrines of grace. Um, but yeah, so like I said, we're going to be answering common objections to Calvinism. And the first objection, just to get right into it, is that Calvinism destroys the gospel. I mean, destroys evangelism, I thought. Calvinism destroys evangelism. If Calvinism is true, why should we evangelize? And that's one of the common objections that I hear. So this is a free flow conversation. Whoever has the answer, maybe give the answer, and then you can bounce off of each other and all that stuff. But yeah. What would you say to that? Calvinism kills evangelism. So of the objections to Calvinism, this is the one that I actually um, understand the most. I, I get it. Um, not that like I, I, I agree with the objection, but that I understand where they're coming from. Um, my, my grandfather's an evangelist. Um, that's like his, his job. And so he has sort of passed on to me this evangelistic heart. Um, and I think I constantly, constantly pray for God to break my heart for the lost. And so, uh, and I'm flying the Calvinistic view. I can understand why when we think that way, it could almost make evangelism feel pointless um, and purposeless, but like, that's not really the Calvinistic assertion in reality. It's that um, yes, God has elected people to be reached, but they still have to be reached somehow. Um, and so he appoints us, as the evangelists and as the workers of the mission to go and reach them um, and, and reach the elect. Like that's, I mean, that's what evangelism is about um, from the communistic perspective. Yeah. Um, just to add on to that. I'm, I mean, from, from our point of view, it doesn't kill evangelism rather it actually aids it. Um, just imagine you have this synergistic view of the grace of God that you go out and evangelize and you have God trying to save people but his gospel is not enough to overtake them and change the disposition of their heart. So what's the point of evangelism if you're an Arminian? If God is trying to save somebody, but what's limiting him is the autonomous free choice of his creature. I mean, for a Calvinist, I know that when I preach the word of God, that God, God, the Holy Spirit will regenerate his elect. And mm -hmm. we just, and we just, not, we trust in, in the, in the ordinary means of grace that God has given us. And we preach the word faithfully and we, we let God take yeah. care of the results. Yeah. yeah. A text I like to go to um, all the time when people ask me this question is Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The gospel is the means by which God uses to bring his elect to the faith. We preach the gospel. The spirit effectually calls those whom God has predestined unto life. Um, through the preaching of the gospel, through the word and the spirit. Um, so yeah, Hector, you about to say something? Yeah, um, from a historical perspective, um, John Calvin was a huge promoter. And I'm not sure if he was active in mission trips, but he was a huge promoter of mission trips. And another thing, um, what would the Puritans say? You know, the Puritans use this word, the means, right? We are the means, just like Elijah said, by which the gospel is brought forth. Scripture says we are instruments, and there's an illustration that there are good instruments for good use and instruments for not so good of a use. So we are the instruments, and like the Puritans would say, we are the means by which the gospel is brought. We are the instruments. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the point you made about John Calvin is super true. I mean, that was his whole, his whole idea was he would bring in people, and they would come and, and stay in, in his church, and he would train them and send them out. I mean, that was a large part of his ministry was sending people out. And so he did have a huge focus on evangelism. I um, mean, and yeah, I mean, if we believe in total depravity, let's just say we only believe in total depravity um, and not the doctrines of, of election and of predestination, like evangelism at that point doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. If God is not the sole proprietor in, in the process of regeneration, and yet we believe in total depravity, 
evangelism is a pointless battle because no one will ever be regenerated. Right. And so that's, that's the thought just to clarify. Yep. And I also want to add that the Puritans had a, such a high view of evangelism, not only because their eschatology that was mostly post-millennial, but also because uh, the way they saw this, you know, uh, a perfect example is David Brainerd, a young guy that died on uh, next to Jonathan Edwards, his book, impacted not only the Native Americans, but impacted parts of Africa and Asia, because it's, it's about bringing the gospel. And these people were Calvinists that were bringing the gospel to the people that needed it. Amen. Amen, bro. I think a lot of the heart of people who, who argue um, that Calvinism wrecks evangelism are, are making the assertion that it means that less people are saved if Calvinism is true. Um, which isn't necessarily inherently implied. Um, you know, God never gave us a number of how many people he would elect. And so, you know, there, there was actually, I was actually reading like a bit of a, a discourse on this about, because there's, there's basically three views. You have the narrow path view, you have the God's not going to let Satan get the overall majority view, and then you have the universalistic view. Well, we, n- none of us agree with the universalist view. Um, and then it really comes down to what, whether there's the question and Charles Spurgeon actually makes this argument. He's like, how can we expect the sovereign God to give more into the hands of Satan into the, in, into hell than he would into the kingdom of God. Um, and then you have those who say, well, it's a narrow path. You find it who will then say that less are elected than aren't. Um, whichever one is true, the, yeah. the, the assertion that um, Calvinism wrecks evangelism is still wrong. But, but I, I think a lot of the heart, it, like I said, is that, um, it means that far fewer people will be saved, which I just don't agree with. Um, I don't think election means less people are saved. The, the implication yeah. would just be that more people are elected, right? Yeah. Yeah. We don't, even, we don't. We don't know the mind of God. Like you said, we don't know how much people are going to be saved. We don't know how much people He has chosen chosen before the foundation of the world to save. Exactly. Um, especially with my eschatology, I believe that a lot of people are going to be saved. When we speak of the doctrines of grace, this is what the scripture lays out, how God saves his people. Then God has elected a people in Christ. And what he does with the others is he pass, He lets them go. He passively lets them go. He doesn't actively harden their hearts. Rather, he lets them, he lets clay be clay. And is, is he just in doing so? Absolutely. I mean, why does he, the question, the question should be, why does he save at all? Not why. Let, 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 well, let, let's wait for that. Cause that's a question that I want to <laughs> get to. Cause that, no, that's a very, very common objection. And I think that people don't understand who God is when they ask that question. Um, but yeah, that, that's another, that's, we're yeah, going to get there. But um, question two, um, I mean, objection two is John three sixteen and second Peter chapter three, verse nine disproves Calvinism. And before we get into it, let me just read these verses and show you why they say this, right? John three sixteen. we all know the verse. We grew up knowing this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So their objection is that, well, John says, whosoever believes um, will have everlasting life. And they're implying that everybody has a moral ability to choose God. And that's just what they think this verse is saying. The second verse is Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Um, so, yeah, who, who wants to take that? I want to take Second Peter 3, 9. I'll go at the John 3, 16. Well, yeah. John 3, 16, it's, it's a poor translation. The Greek reads, Monagone ido kenghina pas hopistuon. Pistuon is an active verb, um, meaning believing, not believe. Who are those who believe? God's elect. Um, Philippians 129, faith is a gift. Um, our Reformed Confession says that faith is something that is wrought up by the Holy Spirit, not by us. We're not, oh, we, you know, this faith is not this abstract thing that we can exercise all the time. Rather, it's something wrought up by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the word. So, I mean, John 3, 16 actually proves our point. Who are those who believe? Those who have been given faith from on high. And that's why when people like try to say, oh, I can never agree with limited atonement. If you, if you believe in John 3, 16, yes, you do. Not in the same way that we do, but every Christian believes in a limited atonement. What does it say? Whosoever believes. The atonement is limited to those who believe, to those who place their faith in Christ Jesus. But yeah, Yeah, yeah and I mean, the word whoever, 
um, it's really a, a, a poor translation and it's not a smooth translation to the English. I don't think it quietly, um, like, you know, our Greek nerd said, uh, it doesn't quietly make it, you know, to the English translation. And I, I think when you rightly examine the text, it actually benefits the Calvinists because it, and we can bring about the limited atonement aspect because it's, it's pointing out that some are believing and some are obviously not. So um, it, it's not a universalist way, but also it's telling us that it, there's a class that, that, that God has uh, set. Roger, you want to say anything? You good? All right. So Second Peter 3, 9. I want to talk about this one because it's a very, very common objection. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Now, circle that word you. Whenever you see that, circle that word you. Because we have to understand the context of who Peter is speaking to. He's speaking to the Christians in Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Um, and this is who you're talking about. He's not talking about every individual that ever existed. He's talking about a specific group of people, the saved people of God. Not wishing for any of you to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Another translation says willing. Now, we have to understand that God has three wills. His decorative will, his will of disposition, and his um, perceptive will. Now, if, if, if he's talking about his decorative will in this verse, now we have a form of universalism. Because he decrees for all people to be saved. That means, um, because it says not willing for any to perish. If he's not willing in a decorative sense, Everyone is going to be saved, but obviously no Christian is going to affirm that. So that's thrown out the window. So if, what is he talking about here? He's going to be waiting until all of his elect people, all of those whom he has chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved. And the reason why he's bringing this up in the first place is because the people in Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia, what they were saying is that, oh, Jesus is never going to come back. He's, it's been a long time now and he's had to come I'm back yet, but he's trying to tell them, no, he's just being patient and waiting for his elect to come to the faith. And this is why we as Calvinists historically have been the people to evangelize the most because of this truth that God is being patient and he's waiting for his elect to come to the faith. And like we said before, we are the instrument by which God brings the elect to the faith. Um, so yeah, Second Peter 3, nine is not disproving Calvinism at all. I think we need to do proper exegesis on these texts that seem to disprove our position. And when we do that, we'll, we'll find that they don't disprove our position at all. Um, they actually affirm our position. Um, but yeah, anybody else got anything to say about that before I get I to mean, the you broke question? it down, bro. You broke it down. I, I really, I want, I, want to, I want to tackle the next question. Isn't it, um, does Calvinism destroy free will? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, the third objection is Calvinism takes away free will. And this is probably the most common objection. Probably. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, so the, the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 9 says, Man in his state of innocence had freedom and power to will and to do which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutably, meaning change, that was, it was susceptible to change, so that he might fall from it. I mean, the, uh, the only people to have free will, a freedom to do what is right, it was Adam. We deny the Romish doctrine that Adam had an internal conflict, um, that's, and if, if that's true, and that's why I say that, that, that doctrine of the, of the state of man, that Adam somehow had an internal conflict that Adam in the garden before his sin and misery was some, it was somehow hard to obey. This is what the Roman Catholic church believes. But if you, if you, if we stay consistent, right, the Bible teaches that we're dead in sins and trespasses. Like Ar Arminianism is like Pelagianism because it has a, a, a watered down view of sin and not making that distinction between Adam after the fall and Adam before the fall. Adam was free to do good out of his nature because he was created in innocence and uprightness, but needed to be confirmed in that state. Adam, through his disobedience, like literally the Hebrew word for death, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. It means spiritual death. Adam. I love what Calvin says, as by the sin of Adam, we were alienated from God and doomed from destruction. We're all alienated from God in Adam. We have no yeah. desire for the things of God. And we see that enmity, the two people, the seed of the seed of Satan and then the seed of the woman. We see that enmity wrought out by Cain and Abel. We want nothing to do with God. To suggest otherwise is to have a Pelagian view of man. 
that man yeah. somehow has the power to buy his own boots, bootstraps, lift them, like change the disposition of his heart. We completely deny that. That's that's nowhere found in scripture. If the condition of a fallen son of Adam is he want, he wants nothing to do with God. He's continually suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because he loves his sin. And to say otherwise that man has, somehow has a free will and it destroys free will. How can, how can, but we have to understand it's just a complete straw man. What God does when he saves a sinner through the preaching of the word is he changes the disposition of their heart. He doesn't drag them kicking and screaming. Rather, the reason why we come to Christ is because we want to. But the only reason why we want to is because that desire was wrought up by us by the Holy Spirit. That faith was wrought up by us by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, uh, what I will say about free will is the only person who has free will is God himself. Um, because even Adam could not do anything he wanted to, right? Adam couldn't be God. Therefore, his free will did not exist. Like he, he had will to an extent. He had a limited will, um, even, even before he had sinful nature, even before the fall, because the only person who can truly do whatever they want is God. Um, a really simple example is like, okay, you have free will, fly. Fly right now. Can you do that? No, you are still bound by your humanity. You are still bound to, to reality as, as a creation. Um, and, and then furthermore, what I, what I like to explain, I like to argue is that we don't deny um, that man has some will. And I don't like that argument that, that there is a faculty of will and then there is Calvinism. No, our argument is what man does with his will, with his freedom to choose. Before irresistible grace, man will always use his willpower to choose the things that are against God. And because of irresistible grace, when, when he receives that grace, he will always use his free will to follow the Lord and, and accept yeah. the things of God. So he takes us from rejection in our free will to acceptance in our free will, free will used loosely. I, I mean to refer to the, the way that they use it, not yeah. real yeah. free will. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. And I'm glad that you brought John Calvin, Josh, because I, I brought some uh, Luther. But okay. Lu Luther's point on the bondage of the will um, is, is so amazing. Because yeah. he, what he's saying is, we do what we want, right? If, if that's what you mean, okay. But we don't, choose, we, we don't choose what to want. And that's why Elijah just brought up. You know, we have this limitation because... We, we act according to our desires, but our desires are bended in a particular direction. You, you get the point? So now, we're, you know, and I love what Augustine says on his notes of the will. Man poorly, poorly lost the will to sin. And therefore, you know, we are in the situation we are now. But our desires are bended in a particular direction. Yeah, that's so good. I think... A lot of people who, who, who try to bring this objection and who disagree with everything we just said, I don't think they do. I don't think they agree, uh, understand the disposition of the human heart and yeah. the effects of the fall. What does Ezekiel 36 say? You have a heart of stone. Mm -hmm. You have a heart of stone. You don't want God. You, you, you're, you're naturally opposed to God. Ephesians 2, 3. You are by nature children of wrath. So God must first quicken you by the spirit before you can even respond to him. And that's what makes salvation so much more beautiful mm -hmm. that I was brought from death to life, that I, had, I didn't want anything to do with God. Romans 5, 9, I was an enemy of God. Colossians 2, I was hostile in my mind toward God, but yet he still made me alive. Yeah. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's, and it's it's a, to preach anything other than that, and I honestly, and I'm very passionate about this because, because I think, I think, and though I have a lot of Armenian brothers, but I think, that it strips salvation of its beauty. I, I genuinely really do believe that it strips salvation of its beauty to water down the effect of original sin, to, to not understand the disposition of the human heart and our natural inclination to evil and to sin. Um, but yeah, that's my fault. I um you can oh, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead, Josh. Go ahead, go ahead, bro. Um, I, I actually want to, to point out the, the Eastern Orthodox view of sin um, as we explain this. The, the, the Orthodox Church, um, contrary to the, the Roman Catholic and even the Protestant church explains sin as sickness. Um, and I actually love that explanation as, as sin is an illness that, that we cannot ourselves cure. Um, no matter how much man wants to cure that sickness, he cannot. 
Um, it is not within man's willpower to be cured of that sin. We actually need God to step in and in Christ to be the cure. So the idea, like you, you cannot simply choose health. No, um, you actually need to have the cure given to you. You, you understand? You, you get the point that I'm making with that, with that allusion to the, the Orthodox sure. view. I actually, I actually really like their view of sin. Yeah. Um, because it, I mean, it, it is an illness and is a sickness in us. And, and yeah, Elijah said that Adam's will was limited. When, when we were speaking of the will of Adam, we're saying his will to choose what is good and what is evil. Um, Adam had freedom in a sense that he had the ability to choose what is good and was evil. But Adam would attain that highest freedom because who is the only one that is free? God. He is, he is apart from sin. Adam would attain that by way of covenant. He was created in innocence, created to go to consummation to glory. And that's why the resurrection of our, of our bodies is so important. And then you have the evangelical church who has a Gnostic view, flesh bad, flesh bad. No, no. essentially we were created. We were, we, I love what Origen says, that the glory of God manifested is, is a human being fully glorified. Yeah. Adam was created to go from innocence to glory where he could only do good. And that's why the, on the last day, the resurrection of our bodies, the redemption that our will will be fully free, that we will have, we can only do good. Only. Mm -hmm. It's not in a, in a state the of flesh good. will no longer be sick at all. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The it's illness really will nice. be taken away. And, and that's, that's amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's really sad that the evangelical church has a Gnostic view that flesh bad, like this, this thing is bad, you know, like a Gnostic view, like, oh, like liberation is just like, when I die, the soul, the soul is good, the flesh is bad. No, I mean, essentially, our faculties, our, our heart, our thoughts, and our will is corrupt. That's what's corrupt. Um, but we will be given a new body where we can only do good. And that's the resurrection. Christ is, is in glory. He, he secured it for us. Amen, bro. Amen. Um, so, yeah, the next objection um, is something that I hear a lot from Arminians and people from TikTok and stuff, is that God's election, his choosing is based on his foreknowledge or is based on him looking into the future to see who would choose him, then he chooses based on that. And quickly, I just want to say this. If God is looking into the future, he's learning something. And that would mean he's not omniscient. So that's, that's a big flaw. Um, and it brings... God down. It has a low view of God. God's omniscient. He doesn't have to look into the future to learn anything. Um, and another thing that a, a scripture that they use to, um, well, proof text that they use is eight, Romans chapter eight, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So basically they're saying, oh, see, he foreknew, then he predestined. So how would you guys answer that? Yeah. The, I'm sorry, Elijah. <laughs> no, go ahead, man. You gave it to me last time. Um, the Greek says prognosko. That's it. Doesn't mean God looks into the future. Literally, in Second or First Peter, it says that God foreknew Christ. God did not look into future events. No, it means to enter into an intimate relationship with before the foundation of the world. Prognosko. It doesn't mean foreknowledge, and and that's pretty dangerous if we say that God has to look. And then he chooses based on their decision. That's open theism. God doesn't have to learn anything. Um, he is the creator. He knows all things. Um, but yeah, you can go, Elijah. Um, yeah, th this argument, the reason I don't like it, um, well, one, because it's wrong. I'm just, I'm just stressing, but, but the, <laughs> the, 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 the reason is because it's just a fun way to say that salvation is in man's hands. That, that's all it is. They're saying, okay, let's make this seem like God is doing something so that, so that we're not really distorting the gospel. Because all it's saying is God looks and sees if man would choose. So here's, here's what's happening. Man chooses God. God looks ahead and sees that. So then God offers of it. That just doesn't logically work at all. Not even at all. Because God's really giving is sense. still contingent upon their choosing. Whether you say God foreknew or not, he is, when you make this argument, you're saying that he foreknew their choosing. no. God chooses us to choose, okay? That, that, that's how it works. He chooses us to choose him, you know? And so th this, it, the, the logic, if you just think about it, like write it down and just follow, put some arrows, follow the logic of it, and it, it doesn't make sense at all. Because it doesn't somehow place yeah. the sovereignty back in the hands of God. It just makes yeah. him dependent upon the response of man in a more spiritual way. Like, I, I don't know. I don't like it. Yeah, so yeah. They, they, make, they, make it they make predestination the purpose of predestination is his foreknowledge, but you look at Ephesians chapter one, um, the purpose of him choosing us 
is for the kind intention of his will. Yeah. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. For the good pleasure of his will. That's the reason why he, he chose us. Why? Because he wanted to. And it was his kind intention. Yeah. It wasn't because of him looking into the future. And as Calvinists, we believe in total depravity. If he were to look into the future, what would he see? Dry bones, dead people. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And the thing is, like uh, Josh and Elijah said, um, you know, what God is doing is saving his people. Okay? And what, what open theism says is that God is just throwing salvation out there. And he's like, well, uh, I really hope somebody takes advantage of this thing. Because, you know, um, I died in the cross. And, you know, I, I hope you take a chance of it. And it's such a, <laughs> such a loose way, such a narrow way to see how, how God really operates. Um, and then on top of that, it makes God's respond a reaction. And that is really key because God is the one, like Elijah said, he's the initiator of this salvation. So, yeah. so, so what we're, de- what we're doing yeah. is we're putting the autonomy on man, saying, it's, I have to make the decision, and God responds so it's, bad. It's crazy. That sounds so bad, and that's what people so believe. And it's, it's funny that they, this is a response. They say, oh, Calvinism tarnishes the character of God. No, when you take it away, and I don't, I don't even like to call it Calvinism, but when you take away what the Bible says about God's grace, he, he's not God at all. God is the ultimate cause and the active cause in the salvation of his people. It's not, it's not him reacting, oh, oh what, somebody took, picked yeah, it today. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like, this is, sounds like a human being. Um, yeah, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He's the initiator of salvation. I, I love to point out um, Ephesians 2. A nine, mm-hmm. we have no reason to boast. Listen, if, if I am somehow more inclined to choose God than another man because of something in me that God foresaw, I have a reason to boast. Mm-hmm. I, I have a reason to say, I knew, I knew God was the right choice. I had, which is just not consistent with the Bible. And so the, the issue is they, they almost assert that God looks forward into every man's heart and sees it sees if it sees if some men, if some men have a have a more natural inclination towards God. No, the reality is that we are all equally inclined to reject God, and to hate Him. He, if, like you said, Sam, if he looks if he looked forward and saw and looked into our hearts, he would see nothing but rebellion, at any point in time, yeah. from beginning to end in our lives until He regenerates us. And so, yeah, I just I don't like the assertion at all. And I think you guys are. are I think that's quite. On. I, I think that's quite silly now that you say that. that. Now that you say that, I think it's very quite silly because it's like. They're saying some people are more affected by original sin than others. Is that, that's the assertion, basically. If, if you're saying that some people God are better at, than others, that, that's what it's saying. Yeah, that yeah, there are good people and bad people. It's like, no. It's it's yeah, honestly yeah. Pelagianism, and it's it's so crazy. Like some Protestants even hold this. They really hold a Roman Catholic view of the state of man that Adam had an internal battle. And then when Adam sinned, nothing really happened because you can cleanse that sin away by original, by, by baptism. And then when you do that, you still have that internal conflict. No, there's no internal conflict going on with people who are dead in sins and trespasses. Rather, there is no conflict. The, conf- the conflict starts when you have the spirit of God living inside of you. As Romans 7 says, that conflict between the, the and in Galatians 5, um, the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. No, but the natural desire of a fallen son and daughter of Adam is to sin. There's no conflict there. They just love to do it. They hate God, alienated from God, strangers. But through the preaching of the word, through the Holy Spirit bringing about about faith in them, regenerating them, they have new desires. They desire after righteousness. They have the ability to sin, the ability not to sin. And it's it's really crazy. Um, So, yeah, guys. Next objection is Hebrews 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 says that we can lose our salvation. Okay, I, I have been talking a lot, but it's just, just the context of Hebrews. Hebrews, Jewish people, the book of Hebrews was written to um, a Jewish audience. Um, there's, there was pressure going on in that, in that, in that, re- in that area. Um, this was written before the destruction of the second temple. And the, these were people telling Jews who converted to Christianity, come back to Judaism. 
But the, the exhortation of the apostle, I believe the apostle Paul, but not written by the apostle Paul, preached by the apostle Paul. The exhortation is there's no need to go back to Judaism. Jesus is a better sacrifice. Jesus is a better priest. Jesus is a better Moses. He is faithful over the house of God as a son. Moses was faithful as a servant. There's no need. Jesus is better than the lamb offerings. There's no need. So there was this pressure going on in the Jewish community to convert back to Judaism after coming to Christianity. And there's these warning passages for the covenant people of God. And the whole excerpt, what does Paul say? We have hope of better things for of your salvation. So he's not saying you can lose your salvation. Rather, he's, these are warning passages for Jews who were tempted to go back to Judaism. But he made a great point. The whole exhortation of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better. That is old. That typological covenant at Sinai has found its fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. Yep. And now that you brought some context, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the case why you can't lose your salvation. And you can't lose your salvation because salvation is a monergistic work of God. Um, one active agent, you know, it, 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 God is the initiator. He's the, and he's going to be the perfecter of it. Um, if you have, this is why I love, um, you know, the, the TULIP acronym. And I like the perseverance of the saints or the preservation of the saints. Because it, it, it highlights if you have a monergistic or a synergistic view of, of salvation. If you think that heaven is helping those who help themselves and God is reaching his hand and you're reaching yours and it, it's all synergistic, then, then of course you're going to lose your salvation. Because you're, you, you're a human, you make errors, and from there, of course. But salvation is a monergistic work of God and he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. And that's why I say that, the, you know, the perseverance is a continuous operation of the Holy Spirit that begins in the heart. And he's going to bring it to perfection in the day of consummation on the last day where we're, when we're glorified. So our seal is the Holy Spirit, and he's going to continue the work that he started, and he's going to do it perfectly. Because Jesus is the perfect shepherd. He's the perfect shepherd. He doesn't lose a sheep. That's why he says in the book of John. So anything that God does, he does it perfectly. And that includes our preservation. Um, I've read about it. And actually, I actually like the argument here that um, the writer of Hebrews is referring to a hypothetical case um, where he's essentially arguing if someone could, right? He's saying, um, it, it, sorry, if someone could, uh, been, been enlightened and, and taste and, and see the Holy Spirit and walk alongside the Holy Spirit and all these things, if someone could and then stray away, right, then it would be impossible for them to be saved again. That's, I think, I actually, I align with that argument more and I, I like that, um, that explanation a lot. Um, if someone could fall away, truly fall away, it would be impossible for them to come back. Um, and so, and then I, and you, you read Hebrews 6, 9, though we speak in this, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Um, and so it's like, though I speak in this hypothetical sense, like I'm confident that that won't be the reality, that that won't be what happens. Um, but I also love your allusion to the, the context here, Joshua. Um, another thing, I think it's super interesting. We talk about um, this passage immediately following it in, in 13 through 20 is assurance of God's promises. Like it's, it's crazy that those two things go hand in hand. Um, that's, that's why I love the verse of Ephesians 4.30. Because it's like, Paul's like, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, which people who believe that you can lose your salvation would argue that, oh, if you grieve the Holy Spirit so far up to a point, then you will lose your salvation. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, comma, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And I think that Paul is just responding to this argument that, that he, he, he must have encountered at some point, right? That salvation can be taken from us. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's wrong by whom you were sealed. Like those two things are right next to each other. And I don't think it's any coincidence that we see those two things appear. That's so good, bro. I, I remember when I, before I was even a Calvinist, I always, I mean, no, actually before I was a Calvinist, I believe that you, once you're saved, you will always remain saved. And that one of the reasons was because that verse right there, um, and also Ephesians chapter one, verse 13, it says in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, um, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit by which is a guarantee of your inheritance, right? You're sealed. You are given a seal. Then my question for people who think that you can lose your salvation is who can break God's seal? Exactly. Nobody. Uh -huh. Who can break God's seal? Can you break God's seal? No, nah, you're not strong enough. I know you're not. 
Exactly. And I love what the Westminster says. The perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the, immu the immutably, I can't, can't speak, of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ and the abiding of the Spirit and the seed of God within them and the nature of the covenant of grace from all which ariseth also certainty and infallibility thereof. Our, our preservation does not depend on our free will. It doesn't depend on us cooperating. It's not like God saves us monergistically and then sanctification is some yes sanctification there's a we, we 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 participate in sanctification but ultimately that perseverance is you have to cooperate with my grace you have to cooperate no it's it's the eternal love that god has for his people that he will bring about their salvation that he loves them not because of what's inherently in them but because of who he is to the praise of his glorious grace and he will finish what he has started because his glory is on the line Ultimately, his glory is on the line. And that's why God always, when he makes a promise, he swears by his name. My glory is on the line. God will be glorified in the salvation of his people. He cannot fail because God is not a failure. His glory is on, his glory is on the line. Yeah, I, I like to argue that if, if our goodness is what merits the maintaining of our salvation, then our goodness also must be what merits the gaining of it. Um, because the argument is like, okay, if, if you are bad up to a point, then you no longer are able to have salvation. But like, how good must I have then become to receive salvation in the first place? You know, mm -hmm. yep. like, I just, I, I don't, I don't get it. And I, it's, it's always like, the question is like, so then how evil do I have to be? I mean, how far is too far? At what point does God say, oh, you don't get to have salvation anymore? And they'll say, oh, well, God doesn't take it away, but I think you can willingly let it go. And I'm like, yo, what? <laughs> that is like another step too far. Because, okay, if you want to say that God can take salvation back from people, at least it's still in his hands. But then to say, oh, God won't do that, but you can choose to stop following him. That's crazy. That's insane. I'm just like. It... <laughs> yeah, that's insane. And I think, I mean, you know, some people, I, you guys might disagree with this one. But some people think this is a secondary issue. I really don't think it is. Yeah, I, it depends how far people take it. Depending on how far people take this, I can I think that it can become a primary issue. It's like you it can said, become a gospel of works so fast. That's my point exactly. That's what I'm saying, and a lot of people take it that far. Um, so yeah, it yeah, can become it, a primary issue. It is. I th I think it is. You know that 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 this this thing, and it's coming out of some pulpits that okay, Christ saves you, He dies for you, He sends His Spirit, but then therefore you're just on you're on your own you're on your own pal. You can fall away. <laughs> it's like it's like what Christ and this is what the Roman Catholic does. I wrote an essay on this. Does Christ merely put His people back in Eden, able to fall away? Adam was able to go into consummation. That, that tree of life symbolizing that eschatological life that Adam would have had if he obeyed and that tree of death, Adam was able to fall away. Does Christ put his people back in the garden of Eden or does he just open the door to righteousness and they have to participate with the sacraments in order to gain righteousness? Or does, as the apostle Paul says, he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Christ doesn't just put us, he doesn't restore what was lost in Adam. Rather, he brings out the realization of what Adam should have achieved for his people. He doesn't put us back in Eden, able to fall away. No, he, he, he does, as the Apostle Paul says, the free Amen. gift is not like the one man's trespass. It abounds. It's, it's way greater. He brings the realization of what Adam should have did. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know. Like how Christ saves you. You believe in him. You have his spirit, but it's up to you. No, no, it's not up to you. It's up to the the sovereign will of God. And if it was up yeah. to me, we'd be, if it was up to us, we'd be doomed, man. I'm telling you yeah. this right now. Look at Paul, what he said in Romans chapter 7. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Starting in verse 15, he said, the thing that I want to do is the very thing I don't do. The thing I want to do, the thing that I hate is the very thing that I do. So it's just like, if it was up to me, I'd be doomed. But thank be to God that he is my keeper. Jude 124, now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling. And I think this this idea that at some point in your life you can you can lose salvation that you've gained is basically that you would have been better off dying before you lost it. And to me, that sort of just screams, God doesn't decide when I live and die. 
right? Because if he doesn't decide when I die, that means he probably also doesn't decide when I live, which means my existence is, con- is, is coincidental, which simply means that God is not sovereign. I mean, if you just let, let it like snowball and think of things in the way that they, cor- th- this is saying, if we say that man can lose his salvation, then God is not sovereign, period. Like, wow. I mean, wow. those I are just all of it like that. have to follow, like. Yeah, that's true, very true. But yeah, guys, we, start, we took a long time at this point. Let's do the last point real quick. Um, the last point, and I heard this before. I don't know if you guys heard this before. It's not really that common, but I've heard it. No one believed in the doctrines of grace till John Calvin came along and Martin Luther came along. What about the <laughs> Apostle Paul? What about him? <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I actually Calvin just was... started reading about um, Augustine recently, yeah. um, who is basically the first fa- church father we look at, the main proprietor of, of this view. I mean, he basically confessed Tulip just not with an acronym and he was living in the 300s. So um, Calvinism steeply, steeply predates um, the teachings of John Arminius or whatever his last, uh, the teaching of the Arminian view. I mean, by a long time. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's so true, Augustine. There's so many people. And you know, the the argument is, oh, Augustine was a Manichaean Gnostic. So he brought Gnosticism. Uh, No, the, the way we test what he said is, what does the scripture say? Uh, you know, the, the essence of Protestantism is the religion of the word. And it's great how Baptists, like you, you, like, you guys are Protestants. What does the scripture say about God's grace, how he saves people, the means by which he saves them? That's, that's like, it's not like, it's not like I just, oh, I just blindly believe John Calvin. No, I, I don't hold John Calvin like this. We're not Roman Catholic. We don't hold, we don't hold tradition in, in the word. Rather, we, ex, we exalt the word of God and everything that agrees with the word of God. We let, we, it flows in everything that that's not, no, we, that's why creeds and confessions are so important. Yep. And one thing is that when you, you know, when you, when we start looking at, you know, the acronym of TULIP, you know, we're using scripture. You know, we're, we're, we're exegeting these Bible verses like John 6, 39, Romans 8, 31, 39, you know, uh, John 10, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Like, these are verses that we're using. So from the teachings of Jesus Christ, like the teachings of Paul, like Elijah said, you know, from the total depravity and the historical uh, Pelagian controversy that Augustine was in, that he had to bring about the, the, the fact that every aspect of the human part is corrupted by sin so so he's extracting this from scripture he's saying man is desperately wicked you know and he can attain his salvation by any means so the doctors of grace man they have a nice track like elijah said um way more than armenianism way more yeah i think i think the attacking of the acronym is just like a really foolish straw man um yeah. Because like, you know, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. The words hypostatic union are not in the Bible. But those are biblical principles that man has simply attached pretty names to, you know, like <laughs> that, that's, that's all it is. And so I think when we, when, I mean, it's just like a, it's just not a solid argument when people argue against like these, you know, these terms aren't even in the, it's like, yeah, okay, so a lot of them yeah. are, first of all, but they're, they're biblical concepts that we've just attached labels to, you know they're coming straight from scripture as you're saying and it kind of sucks that it calvinism is named after a man because then they're just going to start saying you follow john calvin no i don't follow john calvin i follow the bible yeah. what the bible teaches. Yeah. Yeah. i mean that's, that's that. what paul says I, like are you like sorry it's my bad my bad go no, you're good you're good, you're good. like I, I'm, no, you're, you're not good. a follower of paul or of, of, of apollos or whatever like no followers of christ and so though i can reflect upon and enjoy and agree with the teachings of john calvin when I say I'm a Calvinist, I mean, I'm a biblicist. Okay. It means I believe what the Bible says, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, sure. because that's what Calvin was doing, what was teaching the word of God. Um, and so I'm not a follower of John Calvin. I just happen to agree with him. And that's why I prefer labels like reform theology. Yeah. Just, that's what I was just about to say. You know, yeah. um, like that over Calvinism, because there is that argument. Well, John Calvin was just a guy, you know, and it's like, I'm well aware. Yeah. Um, yeah. So before we end, because a past, yo, the most hate I get is from other Christians, okay? The most hate I get is from other Christians, anti, heavily anti-Calvinist people, um, um, you know, telling me I follow a man. Oh, you don't love the Bible. I, the people have told me I'm, I'm a hater of biblical truth. Um, so what's your appeal to the Calvinist haters? What would you say to them? 
Um, because I, I, I hate the fact that this divides us, you know what I'm saying? Um, you yeah. can you can be an Armenian and you're my brother, uh, depending on how far you go. But, you know, like, depending <laughs> how far you go. But, but no, but seriously, though, it kind of sucks that a lot of people that we're – I think Calvinists are the most hated group of people amongst Protestantism. I really do believe that. But what would you okay, say? Okay, I think we invite it sometimes. I'm going to be I'm gonna be real and fair. I think that sometimes we invite that. Samuel and I, we discussed this, that Calvinists have a habit sometimes of being super arrogant. Um it, it's just clear, like it happens to be that, I mean, all Christians, all man has a tendency towards pride. Um, but I think that sometimes things get dicey when we, and we even, I even did this myself tonight when we just sort of say, like, this is the truth. Um, people don't like that because this is, there's some, some of the issues within Calvinism are, are, are divided and argued on. And so when we sort of walk on the scene and we're like, this is how you have to think this is true. And I mean, I think there are Calvinists that have taken it too far that sort of mischaracterize what we as a, a group of, of, of mm-hmm. brothers and sisters believe in. Um, so I think sometimes we invite it, but what I will say um, is my biggest appeal all the time. People argue that I am distorting the gospel, or that I am I'm a fraud as a Christian for believing in Calvinism. I would never willingly believe in teachings that I believe rob the Father, rob the Triune God, and the gospel of its beauty. The reason I I, I align with the Calvinistic view is because I think that it actually prescribes a greater beauty to the gospel and to the, and to God above than the other view, than the Armenian view. Like, I think that it gives him more beauty, more credit, and more sovereignty, and it leads me to worship him because of, of the things I've learned. Just the, the fact, like, limited atonement is a hard subject, but it leads me to worship God because I know that Christ died intentionally for me. Um, he didn't die for the possibility of my salvation, but for the certainty and guarantee of my salvation, which is great in light of Beautiful. total depravity and that I never deserved that, right? I think it, 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 in just... I think it applies beauty to the character of God that is robbed from him in the Armenian view. That's why I believe it. I'm, I'm not saying you're a heretic if you disagree with me. You know, we can disagree. And like you said, we can dis- disagree and be brothers. You know, I think a lot of Armenians there are like semi-Pelagians and need to look into what classical Armenianism actually is. Because I understand classical Armenianism. I get it. I just don't agree with it. Semi-Pelagianism, on the other hand, I'm sort of like, yo, you're walking on some scary ground over there. Like, you might want to watch out. Um, and so we can disagree, like you said, and still be brothers and sisters. I think this way because I think it gives God beauty. I, I think it, it, it really leads me to worship. Um, that's why I believe it. Not just because I want to be right and not, not just because I'm following a dude. So those are my yeah. thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the, the journey of becoming Reformed was, I became Reformed this year. Just, it was, it was slow, like not, not even that long ago. Um, it's just, I just read the Bible. You know, I just started reading John Calvin. And for people who, who, who slander Calvinism, I would just say, you know, because I, I, most of them who do it don't know what they're talking about. Um, and like Elijah was saying that, that, you know, what the Bible teaches about God's grace, it, it's, and when we hold to that, when we, when we reform to the word of God, um, it just, it leads to higher worship that Christ did not die, um, like Elijah said, well, um, he made, he didn't make my salvation possible, rather in my place condemned, he stood for me. And that just like, wow, the, the atonement feels personal and intimate. And it's not just this abstract, no, it's, it's Christ actually identifying with his people, taking on assuming our humanity, coming to through his active and passive obedience, that's reckoned to me, to me, that he does through his spirit, the spirit applies the work of Christ to me, not because of what's inherently in me, rather because of who he is. He is God. He is gracious. He, he loves me, not because of my, not because of my obedience, not because of anything I've done, rather to the praise of his glorious grace. It makes the atonement personal that Jesus is not just abstract. Like, you know, Jesus, he died for me. He represented me federally and on the cross. Um, so that's, that's, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of what the Bible teaches. I don't really like calling it Calvinism, but that's the beauty of what the Bible teaches about God's grace and the atonement of our Lord. Amen. Yeah. And one thing that, you know, any Christian, whether you're a Calvinist or not, um, one thing is that we need to approach the scriptures and anybody that comes and tells you anything like the Bereans did in the New Testament, you know, let's go to scriptures. Um, Let's be, uh, let's love the truth. And, you know, through history, you know, what, what people did, what Christians did, when they had a disagreement, 
that will get together, that will talk about it with humility, with love, you know, and if things got spicy, they got spicy. But at the end of the day, you know, we need to love truth. We need to be humble and we need to use the New Testament as an example. Um, let's not let our emotions get in the way. Um, it tends to happen to a lot of us. You know, uh, it has happened to me, but we need to be humble. We need to go with scriptures and let's listen. You know, we live in an era that people are too opinionated. They, like, they have lots of opinions and it's so hard for some people to shut up and listen to others. You know, um, and, and I think that lays out a good framework because in Romans 3, you know, what, what, what happens to a new Christian once they understand they're guilty in, in, in front of the throne of God? They shut their mouths. Romans 3. There is a sense on which we need to be listening, you know, um, and then have a, a, a response towards our brothers. You know, there's a lot of people that um, may be hostile towards these doctrines and maybe um, our demeanor, the way we, we, we carry ourselves um, may help a lot more. Yeah, um, and going back to something you said, you look at the world, um, you see Democrats, you see Republicans, how they demonize each side. They don't, they don't even wanna have conversation. Which, and I see that in the church as well, but that can't be at all. Um, what the psalmist said, David, how beautiful it is for brothers to dwell in unity and if if you affirm and hold to the essentials of the faith that god is triune the deity of christ penal substitutionary atonement justification by faith if you if you hold to these these essential doctrines there's no reason for us to be dividing and we should be able to talk let's take out the bible and let's hash it out you know but yeah guys so this was our video answering the objections to calvinism i want to thank my boys here for coming on this was very great. This was awesome. This was a very fun series to do. Um, I encourage you guys to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. And yo, see you guys in the next video. I love you guys.